I don't need to sit here and tell you who Spongebob is. Were you a small child or a parent of one at any point in the 90s? Did you have access to basic cable, satellite TV, a streaming service, or a local movie theater at any point? Do you know what a meme is? I guess the point I'm trying to say is that Spongebob is everywhere. He's the Nickelodeon equivalent to Mickey Mouse. He's been on everything. Backpacks, toys, Lego, hotel buildings, paper plates, candy, mac and cheese. It would probably be easier to list the things that haven't been plastered with him. The show's been around longer than most people probably watching this video right now have been alive. It's the fifth longest running animated series in the United States, trailing behind Family Guy, South Park, Arthur, and The Simpsons. It's also one of the only 90s era Nick cartoons to still be airing new episodes to this day, have three feature films, and surprise surprise, it got a few video games over the years. Some of them pretty okay, a good chunk of them not. Today we're going to look at one of the first farts in the wind on the video game end of the spectrum for this series, SpongeBob SquarePants Super Sponge. Developed by Climax Studios and published by THQ under the Nick Games line, it was released on November 5th, 2001 for the PlayStation and on Game Boy Advance a few days later. Though not the first Nickelodeon tie-in game, it is the first video game for SpongeBob in particular. Odd release, the world joined hands in unison and declared it one of the games of all time. It was quickly forgotten by just about everyone. I have yet to meet anyone else who played this game. It's a game I personally remember playing, but also remember being frustrating. This game is notable for a couple of other reasons, but I'll get to that later. Once again, full disclosure, the game is being emulated. I do have a capture card now, but I started recording this game before I got it. Let's begin. As soon as the game starts, we're treated to some clips from the show through some FMV and some vaguely Spongebob sounding music. There really isn't that much to say here. It's okay and a nice touch if anything. Apart from how Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy are mentioned. I I'm sorry, Barnacle Boy and Mermaid Man. Why the reversal? It sounds weird to hear. Barnacle Boy and Mermaid Man. It doesn't even sound natural. Man Ray's also in this game apparently. That should be neat. Game starts, and our storyline is fed to us by the narrator. It's Patrick's birthday, and we need to get him a present. And what could be better than an autographed photo of Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy? How far will he go for his best friend? Apparently, not that far up the street was the answer to that question. Also, Patrick's house is literally right there. Is he not worried Patrick will see him? Then again, this is Patrick we're talking about here. Here's your present! Barnacle Boy clearly doesn't want you here in his faking excitement based on the amount of exclamation points in his text box versus his tone. He sounds more like he did deny why he was getting the kids meal at the Krusty Krab. Well, we are a bit busy right now, no rest for superheroes. <laughs> I gotta fit in the tights, you know. They got Spongebob to leave by asking him to go make a sandwich consisting of... Uh, see nut butter, tomatoes, jelly. I already did this joke in Thrillville, I'm not making that. The game's plot is extremely simple. Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy send you out to do this, that, and the other things so you'll leave him alone while Spongebob thinks it's work towards the autograph. The game is a side-scroller in a sort of 2.5D perspective. You move around doing basic platforming and various gimmicks within each level in the form of items scattered around. Spongebob can jump, ground pound, and interact with the world depending on what item he has. Not sure why they give Spongebob a ground pound, that seems more like a Patrick move, lest we forget what he did to what he thought was Squidward. Every level plays similarly to the previous one. Get from point A to point B, grab the level relevant item before leaving to unlock the next stage, occasionally talk to the region relevant character, all capped off with a boss battle every four levels. The only things that really change are the settings and theme. You got the Bikini Bottom local areas, Rock Bottom, Prehistoric Times, Literally Hell, and Factory Industrial Area. Plot-wise, super, super basic. Each level has Barnacle Boy throwing you in a new direction for a new item, Sandwich leads you to the spot kit. I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Oh! <laughs> Spot kit leads you to new uniforms, uniforms to a single candy bar, but apparently you have the worst luck in the world and can't just go to the f***ing supermarket. It has to be from this very specific vending machine in Rock Bottom because Climax needed some way to stretch this chapter into four levels, and then the tools to fix the Shady Shoals TV. And then we finally get the autograph after Barticle Boy drops some nonsense about the meaning of friendship, Patrick's birthday happens, and finish. It's nothing unlike your typical kids game, especially for the era. If anything, it sort of feels like an extremely interactive episode of the show in a way. The structure is basically just a move the goalposts plot so my romantic and barnacle boy can be away from Spongebob. Nothing uncommon in the show proper, just presented via video game. It's not an amazing story, but it doesn't need to be. I imagine most kids won't care about the story as long as the gameplay is good. Speaking of which, what's that like? 
The game seems to operate as a mix of Sonic and Mario. Movement and progression feels very much like a Mario game and how the levels are structured, while the health system is lifted straight from the Sonic games. Scattered around the levels, you have these golden spatulas which act as your health. When you take damage, you get knocked back and all your spatulas are scattered around with a limited time to recollect before they vanish. What SpongeBob does differently is that for every five spatulas, a brightly colored one spawns, allowing you to collect more spatulas back in a shorter period of time, rather than capping off at a certain amount when you take a hit. Extra lives come in the form of underwear and are occasionally found in each level. You also get them when collecting 100 spatulas as is platformer tradition. In terms of general movement, SpongeBob feels responsive enough. Left to right movement is snappy and quick, and moving during jumps is easy enough. It's pretty run of the mill for a side scroller, especially by this point in time, so I don't have any complaints. Yet, items serve as new abilities for SpongeBob and can be picked up and dropped off at will. The first one we're immediately introduced to is the Jellyfish Net. Picking this up lets us catch various jellyfish floating around the level up to a maximum of five. As a small ranged attack, we can also toss the jellyfish in front of us by pressing square. Note the use of the word toss instead of throw. Because the attack looks like this in practice. <laughs> The range on this attack is absolutely pathetic. It's not a very useful attack, but that's not to say you can't figure out any good use for it. If you're directly above something, you can drop a jellyfish and kill an enemy. For a creature that freely floats around in the ocean, it sinks like a rock when you throw it. It feels like a sick joke about Spongebob's arm strength in a way. Continuing on item-wise, we also have the Glove World Balloon, which temporarily increases your jump height and slows the speed at which you fall. The Karate Glove, which, while temporary, gives you a much better attack compared to flinging jellyfish at the floor. The Jellyfish Blaster, which is basically just gun. You also got the Boots, which let you walk on surfaces where you would otherwise take damage from. The Bubble Wand allows you to spawn platforms forms in front of you to ascend to new areas, and my least favorite, the Reef Blower. The Reef Blower is a simple concept, suck up items and shoot them back at enemies or destroy special walls, but for some reason the item completely changes your physics. Upon picking it up, Spongebob will have a lot more weight and momentum to his movement. Instead of stopping immediately, he can take a bit to slow down. This can easily ruin jumps and throw off your momentum if you're trying to save time and accidentally catch the blower mid-jump, as this will give you just enough push to send you to your grave. I get that this item is big and bulky, but I personally think slowdown was enough. Why couple slippery movement with it? The other items are inoffensive and work just fine. In terms of enemies, we have everyone's favorite cast of characters. Worm, Crab, Crab 2, Car, The Hooks, Generic Octopus, Spike Throwing Thing, Man Ray. Yeah, for some reason Man Ray isn't a boss fight. You'd think he would be given the plot, but no. He's a standard enemy that can be killed just as easily as anything else. Seriously, you advertise Man Ray as being in the game, you don't even use him that much. Why? Ghost, Dead Fish, Literal Tornado, Clams, Fire, Acorn, and my least favorite of all, this. This thing moves, and it moves quick. If you go anywhere near this thing, it will home in on you and ruin your day. Trying to go for 100%? Too bad! You just ran into this thing! Each chapter contains a bonus level. When you collect a certain amount of spatulas in each chapter, you unlock the level. Set in six clams, you collect tokens to buy props for Patrick's birthday. Those things that appear in the file select screen. The first one is a ferris wheel, where you primarily use the glove balloon to jump around. The second one is a roller coaster. The third one is a roller coaster that is slightly more difficult. The fourth one is a roller coaster that is slightly more difficult. The fifth one is a fun house that I wasn't able to get footage of. And five bonus levels, three of them are essentially the same. To talk about the bosses, at the end of every fourth level, we're given a small blurb about what we'll be fighting and are given a hint on how to beat it with the exception of Chapter 5's boss. Chapter 1 gives us Mother Jellyfish, who is apparently scared of jellyfish. Honestly, I get it. If someone started picking up my children and throwing them back at me, I'd be scared too. Chapter 2 is Subshark, a creation of planktons that went haywire. Chapter 3 is the Parasitic Worm, a worm inside of a whale. Chapter 4 is the Flying Dutchman, literally the Flying Dutchman that you just have to shoot to death. Chapter 5 is the Iron Dogfish, and the game doesn't even know what to make of it. It literally just tells you, mm -hmm. All of them center around gimmicks present within each chapter. The Jellyfish Death, the Launcher, the Bubble Elevators, yada yada yada. While the topic of enemies is in the air, let's talk about damage. This game likes attacking you, and it likes doing it a lot. You'll find bunches of enemies and hazards clumped together frequently, and they will constantly screw you up. The flying yellow squid things especially, if you try to avoid ground enemies by getting to higher ground, they will quickly swarm in on you if you're not paying attention. And once again, if you're trying to get all the spatulas, good luck. 9 times out of 10, they'll land at a spot that will insta-kill you, in a spot that won't be reachable in general, or you'll take another hit when the invincibility period wears off, which will lead to any still-sitting spatulas vanishing completely. To cap this segment off, I'll touch on difficulty. 
Honestly, the game does get more and more complicated the further you get. Platforming gets more and more complex as more mechanics are introduced and different enemies are added into the mix to keep you on your toes depending on the location. A good example of this is the Hermit Crabs and the Regular Crabs. The Hermit Crabs appear for the first two chapters before disappearing completely in place of the Regular Crabs. The Hermit Crabs move in one direction all the time non-stop, but the Regular Crabs can stop just before you land to trick you into getting on the floor at the end of a butt bounce leaving you open for hits. There's also the introduction of more moving platforms, larger open areas with the jellyfish, the aforementioned bubbles appear as temporary platforms that you have to move quickly across, the boss fights require you to have a good understanding of a specific gimmick to some level to effectively beat them. Chapter 1 is a good example. I put down the jellyfish net attack as ineffective and borderline useless, but is ultimately something you need to learn how to use effectively to beat Mother Jellyfish. One more thing to touch on, the game does have a habit of introducing various gimmicks and taking them away almost immediately. A good example of this is set in Sandy's Tree Dome. This is the only level in the game that makes use of Spongebob's helmet, which forces the player to move quickly as to not be insta-killed by running out of water. It appears in this level and this level alone, and in a way it's kind of a missed opportunity in my eyes. You could potentially use this for a time trial mode almost. Or better yet, have certain sections of the level that are just air pockets that Spongebob has to run through. Visually, the game is a 2.5D side-scroller. All characters and world-relevant items are 2D, while floors and set pieces are in 3D. Definitely not going to be harsh on the visuals here, primarily because it's PS1 and, honestly, it looks decent enough. It's visuals of the show crushed into a PlayStation. You don't need to do much more than that. The menus look okay. The level select is a map of sorts, and the menus have bamboo poles as their borders. Level screens are also title card backgrounds in the show, which is a nice fun detail. It's like going to new episode segments. It's nice. Some of the graphics are a bit on the crunchy end of the spectrum, but that's to be expected with the era. The visuals haven't aged badly, the sprites for the most part look very much fine apart from a few oddities. No YouTuber is physically capable of playing this game and not mentioning how weirdly smooth Spongebob's look down animation is, but most of these YouTubers also have not played past chapter 1 or 2 and have slept on this weirdly good animation of Man Rave of all things. At the end of the day, this game needs to look like Spongebob, and it does just that. This game looks like Spongebob. Does your Spongebob game look like a Spongebob game? It does? Wow, congratulations. congratulations. But does it sound like Spongebob? In terms of soundtrack, there's nothing lifted directly from the show on the disc. All the tracks are original from what I can tell, and the best way I can describe them is that they sound like someone thought about Spongebob. Not to say that that's a bad thing. There is some genuinely good music in here. To further illustrate my point, listen to Lava Fields. I'm a sucker for upbeat, jazzy sounding music, and this is my favorite song in the entire game. And while there is good music, there is some very odd choice of tone that clashes with the theme or even the name of the level sometimes. Before I show you Lonely Souls, think. With a title like that, would you expect it to sound like this? Keep in mind this is supposed to be for a level set in rock bottom, it has zero reason to sound this upbeat and happy. The song isn't bad, I just think that the tone combined with the region the level set in is such a huge contrast, it's weird. The early parts of the game aren't much to write home about musically personally. In my honest opinion, the game's music really starts picking up between chapters 3 and 4. Those levels have some of the better tracks. It sounds Spongebob-like for the most part and serves its purpose. Spongebob sounding music for a Spongebob game. Bear in mind, I'm not really that big into music or have a big understanding of any of it all. My understanding is basically, hmm, yes, this doesn't make me want to claw my eardrums. It's good music. There's a couple moments where the game can get super noisy though, where there's a lot of sound playing all at once. A good example is Chapter 1 Level 4. Listen to this. <laughs> If you want a good listen to the soundtrack in its entirety, you can actually find it pretty easily. Matt Simmons, the game's composer, uploaded the original files to his SoundCloud page as a reference to his commercial work, and you can freely listen to not only the entire OST, but several tracks that ended up not being used at all. The most interesting thing about that personally is track 30, Jazz, which is listed as being an unused track, but when you hit play, it's the Lava Fields music? Why was this listed as unused? I don't get it. Continuing on audio, let's discuss voice acting. To be honest, there isn't that much. The vast majority of the original cast reprises their roles from the show, with only one exception. SpongeBob! Now listen by- Instead of the typical voice actor for Mr. Krabs, Clancy Brown, we get this voice actor, Joe White. 
Krabs doesn't speak a lot in this game to begin with, in fact I think he only appears twice in the entire game, but if you were a kid who had Mr. Krabs' tone of voice ingrained into your head, this would be a bit jarring. I remember playing the original Battle for Bikini Bottom as a kid and remembering Krabs always sounded off. Lo and behold, it's the same guy. This would end up being a common theme for a number of Spongebob games that a voice acted, sometimes Clancy Brown would show up, sometimes he wouldn't. One that I can think of off the top of my head where he was present was in Revenge of the Flying Dutchman, but that's another video for another day. Let's talk post-game for a moment. You probably noticed that there's all these spatula counters on every level, which leads to the next question. Do you get anything for collecting all- No! There is no reward for completing this game cover to cover 100% at all. I tried to. I tried to get 100% as much as I could, but let me just say, and I cannot emphasize this enough by the way, this game is a completionist's nightmare. If you want the honor of saying you completed Super Sponge 100%, you will have to know this game so well up and down you will practically have started a family with it. You not only have to get every last spatula in the level, you have to go through every level and every boss fight without taking a single hit, because as soon as one of your spatulas gets out of reach or vanishes before you can pick it up, you're done. Start over. I didn't beat the game 100% myself, but I was able to find someone who did. In fact, it was done fairly recently as of the point I was writing this specific line into the script. On June 21st this year, YouTuber Kiyowaku Nakira, who focuses primarily on Spongebob games, uploaded a 100% long play of Super Sponge onto their channel, and from that footage I can safely confirm that there is no bonus or special ending for getting every single spatula and party favor in the game. The only thing that I'm able to tell that actually changes is the title screen, which goes from a shot of Spongebob Street to a shot of Jellyfish Fields. As for the props you can buy after every bonus level, all they do is add more scenery to the ending cutscene, which, I'll be honest, actually don't do that bad of a job. It helps it look like an actual party instead of a living room gathering of nothing. The only real highlight of it all is that Gary looks like he just got haphazardly thrown onto the topmost layer. All in all, this game is an average platformer. Nothing insane, but nothing to write home about either. In terms of games I've played on this channel up to this point, I'd say this game is between Bugdom and Pac-Man. Better than Bugdom, but if I had to pick between these two, I'd rather play Pac-Man. It's not men in black levels of hot garbage when it comes to being a tie-in game, but it's not mind-blowing either. It is what it is, and it's the first home console game for Spongebob, so it gets a little bit of slack. It's the kind of game you get for your kids so they leave you alone for a few days. Well deserving of the meh out of 10 rating that it got. Not bad for a first console game, but not incredible either. It has its rough edges, but it does what it needs to do. Be a Spongebob game. It's not something I'd come back to personally, but it's fine for what it is. Normally I'd end the video around here, but there's actually a little more about this game to talk about. At some point, Climax closed one of their studios and sold the assets online. These assets included development discs containing development material and pre-release versions of the game. They were purchased and then dumped online to the Internet Archive. If you want to come around these files yourself, I'll leave the link to the Internet Archive and the cutting room floor in the description. Let me tell you, I spent a ton of time digging through the files and it's like looking into a time capsule. I honestly recommend looking through it. There's development scripts, literal tons of concept art, TRCRF also has links to development builds so if you have some time in an emulator, you can mess around with those. I didn't get a chance to record everything with all the builds. Honestly, if I did that, that would be a video within itself, but I did get a lot of footage of the May 2001 build of the game, and it's a bit of a trip. Between the best legal disclaimer I've ever seen, and all of the jank. So much jank. The game is unfinished at this point, so that's to be expected, but I absolutely recommend looking at it yourself. You can go through the entire game in its unfinished state. It's playable for the most part, some things just aren't quite there yet, but you can still clearly tell they had some idea of what they wanted to do. To go over a few highlights, the original intro from the show was used as FMV at some point. A lot of the characters were 3D renders instead of 2D sprites that they are in the final game, leaving some weird imagery like Patrick being too small and Sandy stuck in a constant loop of waving hello. You can actually look at the hitboxes for the game by pressing triangle. One level is missing half of its graphics, but the collision is there. There was a bubble transition I wish they kept in the game, it actually doesn't look that bad. The bonus levels are there, but they're not finished and are barely playable as they are. Man Ray wasn't in the game yet and his space was taken by the anchor arm shark of all things with the greatest 3D model I've ever seen. The voice actors from the show weren't brought in yet so everyone has this placeholder voice by some British woman. Look Spongebob, I told you, use your net and go fish. The level select is missing its background and is clearly unfinished without any music or sound effects either. Mr. Krabs was stuck between realities, Sandy's tree dome had a different design for the tree itself and the water tubs. You actually had to press down to refill your water and it drained a lot faster. 
There's a secret hole in chapter 4 which has a bunch of spatulas. Not only are the spatulas not here yet, but you have to exit like 5 or 6 times to actually leave the area. Speaking of chapter 4, it crashed my emulator a few times. I could go on, but this video is long enough. I'll leave links to the back of discs and the cutting room floor in the description if you want to look at those yourself. That's all I have for today. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. I'll see you next time.